Hello, in this episode, I want to ask who was the God that Jesus and his followers worshipped? And I'd like to argue that the evidence suggests Jesus said, who was the God that Jesus and his followers worshipped? And I'd like to argue that the evidence suggests Jesus said Allah, not Deus. Deus being the Roman Western name for the deity. And I want to read some words from this marvellous book, Commentary on the 11th Contentions by Abdul uh, Hakim Murad. Now, he is otherwise known as Professor Tim Winter of the University of Cambridge. He teaches Islamic studies there. And obviously, he's a convert to uh, Islam. And on uh, page 22 of this book, um, which I'd like to read to you, he says the following. The Aramaic Gospels present Jesus praying to and praising the God whom he worshipped, naming him Allah or Allo, the Eastern and Western vocalizations. Aramaic is a language so close in structure, vocabulary and sensibility to Quranic Arabic that Arab viewers of Mel Gibson's snuff movie, The Passion of the Christ, can follow much of the dialogue. Crusaders in every southern multiplex should wonder about this. Jesus surrendered to his Lord and his words, whether or not they are authentically preserved, indicate perfect slavehood to El slash Elohim, the Hebrew, Allah, Aramaic, Allah, Syriac, Allah, the true name of the one God of Abraham, peace be upon him. After the end of his ministry, Jesus' followers continue to worship the Jewish God in congregation at the temple. And here um, Tim Winter references Acts chapter 3, verse 1, which I'm now going to read from my uh, New Revised Standard Version, where we read, one day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer at three o'clock in the afternoon. Now, why is that uh, significant? Well, this is so this is after Jesus ascension into heaven. Now, the hour of prayer at three in the afternoon is not like in, say, the Church of England, where you where you go just to have some prayers. No. This is the hour of sacrifice as well. So the Jewish system with its sacrifices detailed in the book of Leviticus in the Old Testament and the Jewish understanding of God is still very much adhered to by the chief disciples of Jesus, Peter and John in this case. And um, Tim Winter correctly goes on to note um, like Jesus, they continued uh, to worship the God of the prophets. Now, Tim Winter uh, then goes on to quote a very high profile and famous Roman Catholic priest called Hans Kung. Now, he's a very distinguished Catholic theologian, and he wrote the following, and Tim Winter quotes him. This was the original Jewish Christianity of the first disciples of Jesus the original Jer Jerusalem community and the communities east of the Jordan. In other words, the very first paradigm of Christianity before the shift to the Greek Hellenistic paradigm. And Hans Kung goes on to note that primal Christianity contains the theology of Judaism and Islam and obliquely proposes this as a basis for reconciliation, end quote. So that's the, the chapter 12 in this book, Commentary on the 11th Contentions. And it's fascinating as only later um, with the theologizing of the Hellenistic Greek Jew called Paul of Tarsus, Christians call him the Apostle Paul. It's only then that we find this shift, this paradigm shift to a quite different understanding where you have a, a savior cult, uh, where the Messiah himself, Jesus, becomes a savior figure, uh, God himself. Whereas in the original um, historical Jesus, 
God is the center of Jesus's proclamation. So he proclaims the oneness of God um, uh, in, in the Gospels. We still see that today. But it's fascinating um, that uh, Hans Kung is quoted. He's such a senior Roman Catholic theologian, and he sees um, the truth of this, and he proposes this as a way of bringing together um, the, the people of the book into a common word. And on that very uh, theme, I just want to quote to you some words uh, from the Quran. I'm going to quote from the clear Quran, a very famous verse in chapter three, the family of Imran, where it says, say, O prophet, O people of the book, Jews and Christians, let us come to common terms that we will worship none but God, associate none with him, nor take one another as lords instead of God. But if they turn away, then say, bear witness that we have submitted to God alone. And that strikes me as something I'm sure that Jesus, the historical Jesus, would have accepted and agreed with, in fact. And on a slightly uh, different note, I just want to quote some words from this fascinating book, The Brother of Jesus and the Lost Teachings of Christianity by a, a, an American called Jeffrey J. Butts. He's an ordained Lutheran minister and a professor of world religions at Penn State University in, in the US, obviously. And he says some um, fascinating things um, about Islam and Christianity and Judaism and what happened to Jesus. And I just wanna read these words to their self-explanatory, I think. Uh, by the way, he is he, a Christian writer, so he believed Jesus died for his uh, died on the cross. Um, but he says this as abundant evidence has shown us after Jesus's crucifixion, his family and disciples continue to worship together in the temple in Jerusalem. Remember, I quoted from Acts chapter three, verse one, this history of the early church manifesting no difference from their fellow Jews, except in their belief that Jesus was the Davidic Messiah. In other words, a Messiah like David. He's called the son of David in the Gospels. Unfortunately for those, uh, unfortunately for these harmonious beginnings, Pauline Christianity, this is the religion of Paul, increasingly adopted an understanding of Jesus that Judaism could not ultimately bear the Hellenistic theological belief that Jesus was literally God incarnate in human flesh. As the doctrine of the incarnate incarnation became ever more central to Gentile Catholic Christianity, this was later on, of course, an impassable theological wall arose between Jews and Christians. You see the parting of the ways between Jews and Christians here later in the first century. The doctrine of the incarnation is also a great wall that separates Muslims and Christians. Most Christians today are completely unaware that Muslims highly revere Jesus and honor his teachings, even though they, though they even believe in the virgin birth. But like their Jewish cousins, the strict monotheism of Islam could never accept the key Christian dogmas of the incarnation and the Trinity. It is therefore potentially significant for interreligious dialogue today. I remember the quote from the Quran there, let us come to a common word, that one of the firm conclusions of modern research into James, and he's already established in his book that James is the actual brother, blood brother, of Jesus, and he actually became the leader of the early church, interestingly. One of the conclusions of research into James has revealed is that neither Jesus' family, nor the apostles, nor his Jewish disciples believed that Jesus was literally God. They believed that Jesus was the Davidic Messiah, adopted, in inverted commas, by God as his son at, the, at his baptism by John, but still a human being. That the earliest Christian doctrine was in no way incompatible with, Christ, with Jewish doctrine is evidenced above all, above all by the fact that the Jews in Jerusalem continue to accept Jesus' followers as fellow Jews. In fact, they saw them as being particularly rigorous and pious Jews. 
And earlier in this book, um, Jeffrey Butts uh, references Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, who does mention James, uh, and particularly that James was seen by other Jews um, as particularly pious and law abiding. Um, and this is remarkable. So it shows that at that stage, the original family and disciples of Jesus hadn't broken from Judaism. The idea of the oneness uh, ahad, the oneness of God, it was still believed by them. If they had proclaimed the Messiah to be God uh, and that, that um, one's sins were forgiven through the incarnation of Jesus and death on the cross, that would have been, of course, completely anathema to the Jews as it is today. No Jew today, no practicing Orthodox Jew, will even go into a church, a Christian church, because they see it as a place of idolatry. Very interesting. So the author continues, it is more than intriguing that the Muslim understanding of Jesus is very much in conformity with the first Christian orthodoxy, the original Jewish Christian understanding of Jesus. So here we have uh, a Christian academic um, who, who is still follows Christianity. He gets it that the Islamic understanding of Jesus is in fact the same as the earliest uh, understanding of Jesus, what they originally believed. Isn't that interesting? Very interesting. And I'll just read a last paragraph here. If Jewish Christianity, the original that is Christianity, had prevailed over Pauline Christianity, history would likely have been written quite differently. Um, it is quite likely that such atrocities as the Crusades, the Inquisition and the Holocaust would never have transpired. It's an incredible statement. This. If the Jewish Christian understanding of Jesus had prevailed, which obviously it didn't initially, Jews and Christians might never have parted ways and Islam would never have become Christianity's perceived enemy. To this day, it is the refusal of Jews and Muslims, remember, who have the original understanding of Jesus and the community around Jesus, it's their refusal of these people, the Jews and Muslims today, to accept the full divinity of Jesus that makes them pagans and heathens in the eyes of many Christians, end quote. Now, isn't this supremely ironic that those who most publicly confessed to being followers of Jesus, the Christians today, are mostly not following the faith of Jesus and his original disciples themselves. People who are, though, following that original understanding um, are, of course, Muslims, because unlike Jews, Muslims still do accept Jesus as a prophet, as the, the promised Messiah. And Jews, unfortunately, uh, do not. So, so one could argue the only people today who are authentically following the real Jesus, the Jesus of history, are Muslims. And one, I think one should add, those Christians, and they do exist in, in large numbers, who also accept that Jesus was a prophet and Messiah. Now, Unitarian Christians obviously do that. But also, I've discovered many priests and even bishops in the mainline churches. I'm thinking of, say, the Church of England and some other churches, like the Methodist Church, actually privately also believe that too, that Jesus was only a prophet. And uh, and if they believe he is a son of God, it's in a metaphorical sense. It's not meant literally as a metaphysical, actual God begetting a son. Now that's criticized, of course, in the 112th Surah of the Quran, in, in an extraordinary piece of precision theology. It lasers in to the Council of Nicaea, which uses this language of the son begotten, of the father and it, it directly refutes that and affirms um the original belief of, of the, the the jews themselves so the the quran is very much uh, endorsing the tawhid of jewish monotheism as we see in um uh, in, in the torah for example so um that's the end of of um this video just to conclude um aramaic the language of jesus um, is extremely close to Arabic, as is Hebrew. They are cognate Semitic languages. So, of course, Jesus would have called God Allah with his Aramaic accent, his Aramaic pronunciation, 